chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. It's our passage for today. It's what we read. Then he showed me, Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, uh, let them put a clean turban on his, set, on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you, will, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that, that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. The word of God. Let's turn to him in prayer. Father. We ask of you to meet us through your word today. Jesus, we pray that you are ever so present in our midst by your spirit. So help us to hear, O oh Spirit, what our God desires for us to hear. And we pray for attentiveness, clarity, and conviction. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning our topic is justification, and we'll be looking at uh, justification from three angles, uh, three points of justification, defining justification, point two, embracing advocacy, and point three, facing accusation. So three things pertaining to that great doctrine, and we'll flesh it out through our text today. John Murray, who was a professor at Westminster, some years ago, Westminster is a seminary that is about 30 minutes from here. And uh, he was a professor who wrote a great deal of books and things pertaining to uh, the Holy Scriptures. But of the most important, I think, is a volume called Redemption Accomplished and Applied. Uh, that book separates uh, the whole idea of an accomplishment and an application re regarding the salvation that we have in Jesus. And of one of the applications, the first to note is the doctrine of justification. You know, the reason I bring that in is a lot of times in reform circles, you, we hear the word justification thrown around a lot. You hear preachers say things, uh, justification as a blanket statement for salvation, but this isn't completely accurate. It's not theologically dangerous per se, because justification mirrors so much of what the gospel is, but justification is an application to our hearts for our benefit. You know, to explain it clearly, I think I can say that justification didn't happen on the cross, justification happens in the courtroom. You know, going on many years is one of the Kwok family's favorite TV shows, you know, that, that in Jeopardy, uh, and that TV show is Law and Order. You know, we like Law & Order SVU, you know, we're Detective Benson fans. Uh, in Law & Order, there's a great, uh, there's a lot of plots that happen. Um, sometimes I wonder how crooked this world really is because you have to get into the mind of serial killers, psychopaths, and murderers, and uh, people who have twisted minds to be able to conjure up plots day after day like that, right? But I mean, the truth of the matter is we live in a fallen world. And all of us are capable of at least imagining some of those situations. But in the midst of all of the different plot lines that happens episode after episode, the general structure of each show is the same. You begin with a crime scene, and then you end with a verdict in the courtroom. Generally speaking, that's how every show begins and ends. 
you know, the crime scene is where things happen, and the courtroom is where things are proven. It's a verdict that's reached in the courtroom. And that's how I want to um, help us understand justification today, because we're dealing with a courtroom scenario, a place where things can't be changed, right? We can't add any more actions. We can't add to our resume or, or uh, try to refrain from certain things. What's already there is there, and the only thing that can be changed is the verdict, depending upon the lawyer that we trust in. So what we have in our passage, because in verse 1, well, what we have is a situation of three different characters. And Joshua, who is the high priest, and Satan, the accuser, are standing before the angel of the Lord. So um, the angel of the Lord is the judge, and standing before him is Joshua, the high priest, and the accuser, the prosecuting attorney, and that's Satan. Now, before we go on in this courtroom situation, I want to explain the character of the angel of the Lord just a little bit. And for this, I lean heavily upon a, a mentor of mine that I've never met, uh, but I will meet in glory. And his name is Meredith Klein. Uh, he describes the angel of the Lord as a very specific kind of angel. You know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't fit the categories of your regular angel because you see what he does and he's supposed to be categorically distinct from all the other angels. You know, angels are generally seen as people who help, uh, not people, angels are seen as beings who help, right, who help the cause of God, and uh, they're his agents. Uh, but this angel of the Lord re um, has a recurring character time and time again throughout the Old Testament. Uh, one case is in Ma Malachi chapter 3, where this character, the angel of the Lord, is synonymous Mostly called the angel of the covenant. And if you know anything about covenants and angels, angels and covenants don't really mix together. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 actually tells us that angels long for, they look at the relationship that we have with our Heavenly Father because of the redemption and the covenant that's in between and that binds us together. Angels look at that and they long for it because they don't have it. So this angel of the Lord is not your ordinary angel. I think more vividly put is the angel of the Lord is seen as the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. That's the angel of the Lord. So it's safe to say, and I, Klein draws this conclusion, that the angel of the Lord is a manifestation of God in the Old Testament. So when, when Satan and Joshua are standing before a judge, they're standing before the eternal judge for all time, uh, for an eternal verdict for all time too. The problem is stated right away, and we see this in verse 2. After the Lord's rebuke to Satan, the question that he raises is, is not this a brand plucked from the fire? You know, fire is an element that's often associated with judgment, Old and New Testament. You know, you'll see this pervasively, maybe culminating uh, at the moment in the lake of fire in the book of Revelation, which is why you'll hear preachers talk about hellfire. And recall that as judgment and condemnation. But fire is generally something that is eternally, perpetually punishing wicked sinners. Now the problem with how we understand this is we see fire in contradiction to how the Lord has questioned Satan in verse 2. Because we're being plucked from fire. You know, in the late 17th century, during the Salem witch trials, there were... Uh, there were characters who were deemed as guilty and they were placed into fire. They were burned, right? They were placed into fire. Arthur Miller's The Crucible has vivid illustrations and depictions of this. And this is to show that, generally speaking, this, uh, the civilians during that time were placed in a neutral location in a courtroom. But once you were convicted of witchcraft or things, um, things so... I'm stark, I'm in such stark contrast from what scriptures say, then you're placed into judgment and fire. Uh, but the problem with that understanding, which has seeped into our minds today, is we generally believe that we are in neutral grounds as well. You know, it's only the most wicked of sinners who are in fire. And once we commit those kinds of deeds, maybe we're placed in there too. But what uh, what the Lord shows us in verse 2 is that all of us are actually there. 
You know, all of us are being plucked from the fire. And if you look at the character of Joshua, well, which we'll talk about in a bit, his character is one who is upstanding, right? He, is, have, he has as much to brag about when it comes to his righteous deeds. But, you know, uh, we often view ourselves as people who are not belonging in this fire when we actually are. That's something that I'm hoping to reverse as we look at our, uh, our passage today. I want to address the inward legalists in all of us. Because often when we're, get, we're told that we're not doing something correctly, or when we're told that uh, we are facing condemnation if we continue in our ways, uh, what we want to do is we want to go and change that verdict ourselves. Now, we want to step out of the courtroom, add some more things to our resume, feel better about ourselves, go to church a little more religiously, read our Bibles a little more religiously, pray a little more fervently. And we'll stack these things up and hope that that will overturn the verdict. But I want to remind us that this is a courtroom again, meaning all of your deeds are already set out before God. And there's nothing you can do to change that, change any of the things that you've done. You can't add to that list. The only thing that you can change is who you decide to trust in, who you decide to depend upon, your own resume, the things that you've set before the judge, or are you willing to look for a different avenue and not trust in yourself? And that's where we turn to our second point, where we are called upon to embrace advocacy. What's happening in this vision is Joshua is called a high priest for good reason. Uh, the high priest was um, someone in the Old Testament who would go before all of God's people and represent them on one special day. And that special day we know as Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. And if you know the structure of the tabernacle and the building of the temple, uh, the tabernacle was in an elevated location, and within the tabernacle were layers. Layers that show the innermost places being the holiest of places where God is to dwell. His presence is there. Right? And we call that place the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place. And once a year, the high priest had access to go inside the Holy of Holies. Now, the dangers of that is if they were to improperly execute anything, if they were to wear filthy garments, if they were not properly prepared uh, to atone for the sins of Israel, then they would be struck dead on the site because this is the holiness of God we're talking about. So the custom goes where high priests were often uh, shown to wear a rope around their body, bells around their ankles, and they would be walking around in um, inside a tabernacle, and the people outside, if they were to stop hearing something, they would drag out the body because they would know that this high priest was struck dead. There was a considerable amount of preparation involved with the Day of Atonement. Leviticus chapter 16 talks about a repeated process of washing, bathing, and a repeated process of putting on clean vestments before God, clean garments. Because what was outward reflected what had to be inward, inside as well. You know, the, the first thing that the high priest would do is they would walk in and they would make sacrifices for the place. And then they would come back out, clean themselves, bathe themselves, put on new garments, and new linens. And they would go back in and they would make sacrifices for themselves. And then they would go back outside, clean themselves, bathe themselves, put on new linen. And then they would make sacrifices for all of God's people. This was a big event. You know, if you can imagine, if you can imagine uh, a collective events where all of the people are involved in one location, this is the Day of Atonement. And everybody at this point is anxiously looking, to, looking upward towards the tabernacle and thinking, you know, I hope this high priest can make it out. Because their, the, the atonement for their sins was dependent upon one man. And this was a joyous occasion. It said that people would anxiously wait, and once the high priest walked out, there would be a roar, celebration, because all of the sins of that year would have been atoned for. Ray Dillard, uh, who is an Old Testament scholar, notes something extra about what the high priest did. You know, they said, he says that the process for preparation actually started a week before. So these people weren't, uh, these high priests weren't just. Uh, cleaning themselves, bathing themselves on that day of, but starting from a week before, the process was, that would start. And these people would be cleansing themselves, praying, spiritually trying to flesh out any kind of filth that remains in the heart. 
And day after day, these, uh, these high priests would be casting a cleaner image, cleaner image before the Lord, preparing themselves for that day of atonement. Now I want to pause here because if there was anybody in all of Israel, if there was anybody in this world who was clean enough to access the Holy of Holies at this time, the presence of God, it was the high priest. I mean, he spent a whole week preparing himself for this occasion. But what we're told in our passage is that Satan is accusing his filthy garments, right? His filthy garments, which I believe uh, not to be literal, filthy garments, but filthy garments when it comes to an absolute sense because no one is completely clean before the Lord. Again, if there was anybody who could have stood on his own righteousness in this world, it would have been someone like the high priest, preparing themselves for that occasion, cleaning themselves so they can enter into the presence of God. But again, Satan points the finger, accuses them, and the striking thing is in verse 2, God isn't in denial of what Satan is actually saying. When Satan accuses Joshua of his filthy garments, God doesn't say, hey, look, you know, he's, he's prepared a whole week for this. Right? Uh, he, he's, if anyone's clean, it's got to be Joshua. You know, he's my faithful servant. He's done everything necessary to be able to be in my presence at this time. What he says is, no, I've chosen him. I've chosen Jerusalem. And that's why you know, I rebuke you and say that you can't point the finger at him. Implicitly, the Lord is agreeing. You're right, Joshua is filthy. You know, all of the people of Israel, you're right, they are filthy. And they don't deserve to be in my presence. But I've chosen them. And that changes everything. Because on our best day, at the best hour of our best day, we still aren't qualified to be in the presence of God and be safe. Because all of us are filthy within our hearts. And all of us need cleansing to access the presence of the Lord. Hebrews 10 shows this for us. In verse 3, what we read is, But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. This shows us that in, um, in each day of atonement, what the people of Israel might have been thinking and were probably thinking was, here goes another year. Another year where we have to have our sins forgiven. Another year where a sacrifice has to atone for our sins. And another year where, yet again, we're proven to be imperfect, needing an advocate to stand for us before God. But what we read in verse 12 of Hebrews 10 is, but when Jesus Christ, who earlier in, in, in the book is called the high priest, had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Sat down, meaning his work was finished. He didn't have to go up next year and offer up another sacrifice because his work was finished. All the, um, all the sins of this world were atoned for at this moment. And the question is, you know, how could this be? How could Jesus, who is the high priest, offer up a sacrifice that is so much more qualitatively and quantitatively effective than the high priest of the Old Testament? It's because he would be the new Joshua, the better Joshua. The Greek transliteration of the word Joshua is actually Jesus, which is where we get his name. And he also would be a high priest. He also would spend a week in preparation starting from the triumphal entry. And he also, just like the high priest, would pray the night before and uh, not, not get an ounce of sleep, which is something that um, I'm not too familiar with. My wife might be a little more familiar with at this time. But, you know, the high priest would, um, would pray and pray, and they would, um, they would forego sleep the night before. And Jesus experienced that at Gethsemane. While his disciples slept by his, his side, he was praying the entire night. Praying, my Father, take this cup from me. It's too heavy for me to bear so that I might not have to drink your wrath. And on that day, on that day of atonement, just like the high priest, Jesus would also climb up a hill. But unlike these high priests, Jesus was not wearing any clean garments. He was actually stripped naked. He was actually carrying the instrument of his own, of his own execution up the hill. Unlike these high priests, he was not given a turban 
he was given a crown of thorns. Thorns embodying the curses laid upon all of humanity in Genesis chapter 3. The thorns reminding us that we're, uh, we're born into the fire and we, we need to be plucked from the fire. Thorns reminding us that without an advocate, we are eternally guilty before a, a holy and perfect God. Jesus wore a crown of thorns so that we might be given turbans to wear. Because in this public viewing, which was also public, there was not a loud applause celebrating a celebration for the people surrounding Jesus and the cross. There was mockery. There were words that were scathing. There were people who were looking at Jesus saying, how dare he claim himself to be the king of the Jews? You see, this high priest was different, and this sacrifice had to be different because he was a different kind of advocate. Advocacy is what we needed because we're, we left to ourselves. No high priest can eternally give us, a, give us a clean verdict. What we're shown in verses 4 to 5 is that Joshua is given clean garments, meaning that even the people who represent us in this world need to be purified by Jesus. Even these figures that our passage talks about as a sign point toward a better high priest, which is Jesus, because he was a different kind of advocate. You see, because the lawyers of this world will fight for our case, but once we, once we pay them out, they're done with us. You know, but not Jesus. We're shown that in the scriptures. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, what we read is that if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What John tells us is that Jesus is not just someone who's fighting for our case. But once we're given that guilty verdict, Jesus doesn't say, all right, you've paid me, I've done my part, I've tried to fight for you and defend you, but this is an unwinnable case. You know, um, I'm sorry. You're going to have to suffer for your sins. Jesus says, I'll bail you out. You know, I'll pay your fine. I'll suffer your sentencing. I'll go between you and the judge and bear the consequences that you might be set free, have that clean verdict that you, you wanted and you asked for when you called me as your attorney. See, this never happens with the relationships in this world. You invest, and you get as much as you invest in. But with Jesus, he's committed, all in. We see this through him not just being objectively, objectively a judge who sets us free, but personally a judge who convinces us that we are set free, reminds us that he is with us and in us. You know, the, the purpose of Jesus stepping into the fire was not for us to feel as if we still belong there, but that's how a lot of us feel, don't we? You know, when we stumble upon that very sin that we asked forgiveness for a week before, and we stumble into it again, we feel like we're in fear of that fire. We walk around anxious, trying to be on our best behavior because we're afraid of the fire that we might be plunged into. And this is exactly why Jesus justified us, to remind us that we are not going to be plunged into that fire ever. But you see, he knows our frail hearts. He knows Joshua's frail hearts, so he speaks personally into his life. Tim Keller, in a sermon several years ago, mentioned something that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, talked about in a sermon. And uh, Lloyd-Jones, being a British man, observed something in relation to American slavery. Um, 1863 was a great em emancipation proclamation. Uh, but he, he observed that even the times um, shortly after, there was an objective liberation of the black American but there was still an, a subjective captivity where they still feel, felt oppressed. They couldn't walk around as they wanted to. They still felt like they had a master looming over their heads. Right? And that's often how sin works for us, where we are objectively set free from sin, but subjectively we still feel confined to it. We still feel enslaved to it. We're still looking over our shoulders, uh, wondering when it's going to creep in and bring us judgment. But again, I don't, know if, I don't know how you deal with your doubts and your insecurities, but objective truths are great. You know, I, I, I mean, that's something that I stand by. But it's when Jesus speaks personally into my life 
that I'm reminded that I'm freed. I'm freed of any kind of captivity. I'm free in him and him alone. That's what Jesus does for Joshua here. Because the famous statement in Romans 8 is that God is for us, which is a judicial declaration. But the promise in all of Scripture is that also God is with us, walking by our side, treading the waters that we, uh, that we tread, going through every valley, every high, every step of the way. Jesus is with us, personally invested in a relationship. In verses 1 through 5, what we see is that objective statement. Uh, throughout the 10 verses, actually, there's not a word from Joshua. He's just standing there listening in. Uh, but in verses 1 through 5, again, the courtroom scenario shows that Jesus is speaking out to uh, both Satan and Joshua. But he's only speaking to Satan, really. He's rebuking him. And then he's asking, um, asking clean garments to be placed upon Joshua so that he might access the presence of God. But here, objectively, Joshua sees all of this. He sees people removing clothes from him. He, see, he hears Jesus rebuking Satan, saying, that's mine. Don't you, uh, don't you go and accuse Joshua because I've chosen him. He's seen all this, but even with that, right, even with that, in verse 6, we see a pivot, a sharp pivot, where then Jesus speaks personally to Joshua. And here is a dialogue that shows not that Joshua has a clean verdict, but Joshua has a person. See, in verse 4 of our passage, we, we remove the filthy garments from him. Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you. You know, it's a deed. It's an act that uh, Jesus is referring to. You know, I will clothe you. I will give you uh, clean robes so that you might be in the presence of God. I will clean you of your sins, and you will be forgiven of your trespasses. And I will remove your iniquity. That's the promise. But in verse 9, what we read is the same thing, right? And I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. But the promise that comes before that is, Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. And that's verse 8. Servant the branch. The branch in Jeremiah 23 prefiguring the person of Jesus Christ. See, in verses 1 through 5, what, God prom what Jesus promises to Joshua is, I will give you forgiveness. In verses 6 to 10, the promise that Jesus gives is, I will give you me. I will be by your side. I will stand by you. And I will comfort you all the days when you feel accused, when fingers are pointed in your direction. Philosopher David Hume once said that justice has no place in personal family, uh, personal family relationships. And this is what happens in justification, right? If you look at the ordo salutis, the order of salvation, you know, what follows right after justification is actually adoption. And this is what happens in this courtroom where strangers are brought in to be family. Where sinners are brought in to be sons and daughters of God. And that's the forgiveness of sins that warrants us to access God free of, uh, uh, free of our burdens, the things that we do. That warrant that we actually be hung upon the cross ourselves. But that's now discarded because Jesus paid the way for us. No, long, no longer do we fear justice, we celebrate justice. Because justice means our sins are forgiven. Justice means we have an advocate on our side. Justice means victory is eternally ours. So we turn to our final point, the permanence, the permanence of justification through facing um, accusations. Advocacy is needed, right? Advocacy is needed because without advocacy, Joshua, along with the rest of us, will be remaining in that fire. We have to be plucked from that fire. The only way we can be plucked from that fire is, some, is if someone dives headfirst in and rescues us. You know, one of uh, the, the promises in verses 6 to 10 that stand out to me is what we see in verse 9. It says, For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. You know, even before getting into some of the contents of this verse, the whole idea of engraving something is permanence. You don't engrave something if you want to remove it the next day. You engrave something when you want it to be there for the entirety of your lifetime. 
What is Jesus engraving? Uh, we read that he's engraving the removal of iniquity, the forgiveness of sins, the absence of judgment for those who belong to God. The, the powerful, uh, the captivating thing for me is what we read of in verse 9. Even though, right, even though there is a stone with seven eyes. And seven, the word seven, the number seven in, uh, throughout the Bible is a number of completion. We see this in the book of Daniel, also in the book of Revelation. It's a number of completion signifying everything, right? So here what we're shown is that the Lord, who is a judge, the Lord standing before Joshua, standing before Satan, seven eyes symbolizing the fact that he sees everything going on. Not just the accusations that are brought to the table. It's almost as if Satan says, look at his filthy garments like Satan. You have no idea. I know everything about Joshua. And he, he is far more than just filthy garments. And what, what comfort is that for us, knowing that God sees everything. He sees all of our sins. The sins that you want to hide from your neighbor, he sees that. The sin that you, uh, you feel like you're, you're praying away and you're uh, putting into a corner and not letting anyone access, God's there. He sees that sin. And even though he sees all of the filth in your hearts, those he have claimed to be his are eternally engraved with that promise, the forgiveness of sins. And that's a striking promise to me because I know my sins. I mean, there are some sins that I want to undo. There are sometimes sins that I feel like are beyond forgiveness. But you know, what the Lord says is that he sees everything, all of our sins, and all of them are blanketed because of the blood of Jesus spilt upon the cross for us. He talks about a single day and a single stone, which is our single, which is our single affirmation. And the one that we can turn to for our single assurance. That single day is pointing towards the cross. You know, I, I read this and, you know, the first thing that came into my mind was, you know, there might be people who envision that a single day is representing the fact that God needs a whole day to forgive us of our sins. You know, that he needs 24 hours because our sins are so extensive uh, I don't think that's the case. I, don't th I think the single day is pointing towards a fixed place in redemptive history. And on this single day, what we're told is a single stone will represent that engraving. And that single stone we know as the cornerstone in the Bible, where everything is built upon, everything is pointing towards, everything climaxes in. Uh, my favorite praise song, I don't listen to too many praise songs. I hope that doesn't disqualify me from being a Christian. I just don't listen to a lot of music in general. But uh, my favorite praise song is Cornerstone. And the ver first verse goes like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name as our cornerstone. Uh, that song has special significance for me because uh, when Kaylin was one year was a one year old baby, I was uh, I was in the back seat with her at, at a certain time, and this song came on, and uh, for some reason, I mean, I felt like the Holy Spirit rushed, and uh, there was a rush of emotions, and I realized that even with this helpless one year old, she needs to be resting on the cornerstone. You know, there are so many things in life that are going to tug her away. As a dad, I want to do the best I can to make sure that she's led in the right way. But without this cornerstone, it's a slippery slope. And she'll fall, slip, and remain in the fire. We know that with God, we know that with Jesus, he is a firm foundation. Meaning nothing can shake the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. So the question this morning is, do you believe Jesus to be sufficient? If you believe him to be sufficient, this justification is yours. If you believe that you can depend upon him, trust in him in every circumstance. If that's the case, even though God sees all of your sins, he sees all of your filth and the wrongdoings and transgressions before him, he's willing to say, Jesus died for that and I'm willing to bring you in. My promise is for you. 
Because what we see in verse 2 of our passage is a rebuke, a twofold rebuke. What we read is the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Not, is, this, is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Two times Jesus rebukes Satan. And when I, anything in the Bible is repeated like this, now there's emphasis behind it. The Lord rebuke you is another way of saying God's, uh, Jesus telling, um, telling Satan, don't you dare accuse Joshua. Don't you dare do that. And, and his reasoning is not, you know how hard he works for me? You know how, ha- how faithful he's been all of these years? You know how rightly he performs this day of atonement sacrifice? No, his reasoning is because I've chosen him. I've chosen Jerusalem. So don't you dare accuse them because this is a personal issue. When you accuse them, you're accusing me. I mean, remember what Jesus said to Saul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me when Saul was persecuting the church of Jesus? It's a personal issue for Jesus when his own people are accused. And he stands in our place and defends us, defends our cause. You know, I think when this is happening, Jesus is telling Satan, that's, he's mine. You, you, don't, you, don't you dare come near him and put those thoughts into his head. That's her, she's my girl. I'll defend her to the end. And I will never let your accusations turn her to the point of disbelief where she will fall from my grasp. See, Jesus went to the cross for us not to give us a second chance. Second chance is not the gospel. Right? If we were given a second chance, we would need a third chance too. If we were given a third chance, we'd probably need a fourth chance after that. Second chance is, a go- is not the gospel. The second Adam is the gospel. The one who sets everything in stone. The permanence of the removal of sin. The permanence of the forgiveness of sins. And the permanence of his invested relationship in our lives. If we believe in Jesus, we believe that he is for us, not against us, then we also believe that he is with us in our very midst. And he will let him speak into your life. Let him talk to you in the moments of your accusation. Because the tendency, if you're anything like me, is when you're accused, you want to talk. You want to respond right away. You're not doing enough? Well, let me show you. Let me show you starting tomorrow. Let, let me try again, and um, I'll, I'll disprove whatever you're thinking. We want to talk to our accusations, but what Zechariah 3 reminds us of is sometimes silence is the best thing that we can do. Just let Jesus talk for you, talk to you, and assure you that you are his, clothed by his righteousness, never to fall from his grasp. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the grand assurance we have in the gospel. Thank you, Jesus, that you are sufficient. You are enough. And you have always been enough for your people. We pray that we would believe it. We would preach it to ourselves in our moments of unbelief. And that, Jesus, you would do a supernatural thing in turning sinful hearts to you. We thank you for your grace. And we pray that you would immerse us in your mercies. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.